Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble, and I am so happy to be here with Bob James. He is from the UK, and he has had many years of mentoring and coaching indie artists in the music industry. And we're going to talk specifically today about the songwriting side and publishing and deals and all of that stuff that I know because I get a lot of questions from you guys. Uh, Many of you are very, very confused by a lot of the terminology and the contract stuff. And I don't blame you because it does get very, very messy. So we'll get into all of that in a minute. But Bob, I'd love for you to give our listeners some background on you, how you got into working with musicians and and now, you know, where you teach and all of that stuff before we get into all the nitty gritty. Absolutely, Brie. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for having me on the podcast. I really do appreciate it. Uh, My background, first of all, I have to be honest and put my hands up and say I am not a musician. Um, (laughs) I tried and I failed miserably. I tried every instrument I could think of and I just it just didn't work out. My voice broke. I couldn't sing. Um, But I expressed my creative side through DJing. And that's how I sort of started at the age of 13. Uh, I then uh, later in life set up a company called Music House doing um, radio, TV, college, club promotion. Um, And that was uh, very, very successful. Went on to become one of the biggest independent promotion companies in the UK. Um, Sort of multi-million pound turnover, 36 staff. And we pretty much dominated um, the charts in the sort of the late 90s, early 2000s, which was fantastic. Um, always looking for a new challenge, went into management, um, managed various artists, which uh, I had a lot of success with, some double platinum artists and, and also songwriters and producers, both in the UK and in America, um, which sort of led me to a very deep understanding for obvious reasons on publishing. And uh, literally by accident, um, I got drunk on a boat in France with somebody who owned a music college. That's the power of networking. Um, can't stress <laughs> enough. You never I know when that. these happen. Uh, and uh, I was asked to be a business consultant for the college. And then one day, uh, one of the tutors went sick um, and he said, Bob, can you go and do a lecture on artist management? I was like, I can't do that. It's impossible. I'm not a teacher. And uh, anyway, I did. I thoroughly enjoyed it. So I've always now done teaching. Um, and uh, I currently teach at LIPA, the Liverpool Institute for the Performing Arts in the UK. Before that, I was at BIM and I teach, uh, taught, sorry, teach bad grammar. I taught at uh, the University of Surrey. I've done guest lectures at probably most of the big music colleges and universities around the UK and through Europe. Um, and uh, for the last eight years, I've uh, actually taught music publishing at degree level and also um, at master's level as well uh, here in the UK. So I, hopefully I have a little bit of an understanding but the way I approach it, I've worked as consultants for publishers, but because I've also managed writers, I see both sides of the coin. So I can see the different perspectives, what the publishers want to get out of it, what the writers want to get out of it. So hopefully I can sort of maybe bridge that little compromise in the middle and sort of guide people down what could work for you. Yeah, that knowledge will clearly be very useful in this conversation. Um, before we jump into that, I know, you know, when when you kind of offhandedly say like, oh, I, you know, we promoted a lots of people that got all over the charts or I managed a bunch of platinum artists. Like I know everyone's thinking, do I, who are they? Do I know any of those? So are there any ones you'd like to mention that you've worked with? Uh, crikey. Um, uh, quite a lot, actually, on the sort of promotion side. Um, TLC, Crazy Sexy Cool. Um, I was a consultant for, it's one of my favorite albums. Uh, I was a consultant for uh, Arista um, BMG for quite a few years. Um, I did a lot of stuff with Simon Cowell. So if you can mention some of the early stuff, the boy bands, I've worked with Backstreet Boys, NSYNC, Britney, um, 
And, and on the dance side, from Darude, Sandstorm through to Corona, Rhythm of the Night, and mm. uh, some of those sort of big sort of club classics. Um, I always say that we were promoting records in Ibiza when the hippies were still there before it became commercialized. Um, <laughs> so we, uh, so dance was a very big part of uh, the, the area that I worked in. Um, so it's just, yeah, keep, keep my hands in with everything. You know, there's um, some brilliant acts. And it's one of those things that sometimes we get talking about, oh, yeah, I remember when I was working with them and people go, really? <laughs> um, you know, I sort of drop into the thing. Oh, yeah, I was, I was in you know, Malibu and I went out for dinner and, you know, with, and Leanne Rimes was there uh, out there or Olivia Newton-John and people like that. And to me, it's just day to day. It's just what happened then. Right. Um, <laughs> but now I sort of, I, so I, sometimes I don't mention the artist because I think oh, I don't want to be that person that's going, oh, look at me. Totally that name dropper. But I'm sure your students are, are like really interested to hear what you know what you did although maybe some of them be like who's that you know because now that was 20 years ago or whatever <laughs> you know my husband works with college students and they're like who's the backstreet boys you know yeah it's like uh, well luckily um you know, I, I actually stopped management i uh, decided to take a sabbatical from management um just as the pandemic was sort of kicking in uh and one of the last artists i worked with there was two actually it was hannah trigwell who was a youtube creator uh, has worked with boyce avenue and had a lot of success now um, self-releasing, running her own label, running her own publishing company. Uh, and a, a guy called Kelvin Jones, who um, we had a gold album and a couple of platinum singles in Germany, massive radio hits in Germany, uh, signed into Sony. So it goes right the way through. And again, some of them you may not know. Um, I think that with Kelvin, there was a big advert um, by CenturyLink around the time of the Super Bowl. Um, and uh, his song Call You Home was the sync, was the music mm, to that nice. advert. So um, you may not even realize it, but you've probably heard some of them. Oh, that's, uh, yeah, especially with sync, right? You you don't know who they are, but you would recognize their voice or their song. That's that's the key. That's the key. It's, a, it's all of a sudden, and to be perfectly <laughs> honest, it's it becomes a bit of a blur, but what I tend to do um, is... I think to sort of quantify, I once did a back of a fag packet sort of calculation. And uh, I think my clients have sold about 60 million records or something. Ooh. So um, you start looking at that when you go, hmm, maybe I did do something right. Right. Maybe I'm qualified to do this. Totally. Yeah, you never totally. think you are. That's the bizarre thing. I said, why are you talking to me? And they go, but Bob, you did this, this. Um, and I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah I forgot about that. <laughs> I get it. I got it. Especially in education, you know, we feel like that you have to have a doctorate or whatever, you know, like, am I really qualified to be teaching this? Well, I'll tell you what, Brie, the funny thing was I deliberately failed my A-levels so that I didn't have to go to university, <laughs> don't have a degree. Um, and yet I teach on degree and at master's level. I have got a PG cert now, so I'm qualified as a teacher. But <laughs> but no, the thing is, I've got, oh, crikey, I'll give my age away, probably... Um, about 45 years of experience in the music industry. Wow. Th that seems like enough to me <laughs> to, yeah, to be teaching I, for sure. Yeah. And you sort of think to yourself, okay, yeah, but don't go back to the very beginning because they really don't remember those. But. Right. Well, um, you were introduced to me for, by one of my students and, you know, she just really raved about your, your ability to help her understand kind of the, the, the world of songwriting and publishing and contracts and all of that stuff. So let's start with what, with your students that you have now, like what, what are the things that you find that maybe are their biggest misconceptions about all of that, that maybe they, they thought they understood, but they really didn't. The biggest misconception um, is that a publisher and a record label do the same thing. Mm, good one. They don't. Um, they always talk about, oh, I want to get a record label to publish my my music. And you're going, yep, nope, that's two separate copyrights here. That's two separate deals. And it's two different business models. And um, and that's when they sort of go. Um, normally at that point, I sort of get my pen out and a, on a whiteboard and start doing little charts and breaking it down into the two copyrights. Um, and the, the key thing about publishing is that you can, there's, there's different ways as an artist to use publishing. One, it can be a check when you have success, all right? And, and it, you know, they collect the money that's owed to you as a writer and you can get a nice big advance if you have big hits and everything else. Or you can use a publisher creatively to help develop yourself as an artist. Now, if you're a professional songwriter, the publisher is key. That's your business relationship. 
Um, and if you're just a performer and don't write music, then the record deal is your sort of the, the key deal that you do. If you do both, you've got two um, deals to do. And do some labels have a, an associated publisher with the label so they can kind of do both? Well, the, the a lot of people think, yes, they do. Well, obviously, the majors own publishers, they own record labels, but they work separately. So mm. if you sign to Universal Records, you don't have to do a publishing deal with, uh, uh, you know, Universal. You can do a publishing deal with Sony. You can do a publishing deal with Warner Chapel um, or an independent. Um, I would always... Um, when offered, if any label offers an artist a, a all-encompassing record deal and publishing deal, I would separate it out. Mm. I would try and avoid that. I would try and keep my publishing separate, work with them as a label, uh, and then look at publishing later down the line, or work with another team. Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to get as many areas of um, potential and possibility um, and more people working on it rather than just got the one team doing everything. So it's almost like a networking move, right? To to be able to utilize their connections as a publisher that are separate from the connections with your label. Absolutely. And there's some publishers, some independent publishers who are absolutely brilliant at chasing down opportunities for songs. Mm -hmm. um, there are some great major publishers, but there are also major publishers who don't actually really do a lot. They just collect... Um, and I've actually had meetings where I've gone in and say, oh, look, I won an Ivan Novella Award um, for this particular songwriter, this particular song. And, um, and I think, well, hang on a second. You, I know for a fact, because I knew the, the artist, that you just did a collection deal. So you did nothing other than just collect the income. But, of course, that's not the story they're going to tell you. Sometimes they're going to be, oh, no, 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 we can do this, we can do that. But what you're really looking at is, is people have got um, a drive to get a result. And that's really what you're looking, whether it be a label or a publisher. It's a people business. You want passion. Hmm. Yeah, somebody that's really going to represent your music. Absolutely. So what, first of all, when we talked about like being, a, being self-published, is that something you can still do these days or should you have a publisher? And if you are self-published, how do you make sure you collect all of your royalties? Well, it's it's a big mystery that it's all. That's how it's portrayed as a bit of a mystery. The dark arts of music publishing. So we're mm. going to have a publisher. <laughs> the darker. I love that. You know, the, the industry is going to continue to push that narrative. Um, but the moment you write a song and register with a collection society, you are effectively publishing yourself. Now there are certain areas that you have to be aware of, um, and the first thing. Um, is your there's, there's two income streams that can be coming into you as a writer. There's your mechanical income, and which is for copies, um, for your sort of sales and 50% of streaming. And then there's the performance royalties, which is for your public performance, broadcast, et cetera. Um, now, what's often going to happen when you sort of look at these sort of two areas is most people join the Performing Rights Society. So in the UK, it will be the PRS in America, it'll be ASCAP, BMI, um, SASAC, or GMR. So that tends to be the, the first place writers go. However, if you were to look from a UK perspective, in the UK, if you were going for sync, the BBC, for instance, will only um, sync music if you're already also registered with the MCPS, which is a separate society that collects the mechanical income. So mm. the, the easiest thing to do, what you want to avoid and a little tip for everybody, if you want to avoid uh, a publisher looking at, uh, sorry, a, a sync agent or a brand looking at your works and going, mm, maybe not, is the term copyright control. Because if you've got copyright control, that means the control is under, uh, is, is, is with vested with the writer and there is no publisher involved. Now, a sync agent or a brand is going to look at that and go, Hmm. This is going to be difficult negotiating. They're not going to have a standard contract for issuing licenses. They're probably not going to understand it, which means it's going to take me weeks to try and explain to them. Uh, then we're going to be dealing with lawyers who are going to try and read, and they just go, oh, no, it's too much. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would always say, for instance, and it's very simple, that you set up your own publishing company, which could be, in your case, Brie Noble Music, as simple as that, or you no know, BN Music. Um, register as a rights owner. 
Um, so what you're doing is you're, you're registering with the uh, Mechanical Rights Society, so registering with the Performing Rights Society that you own your rights. You're going to collect 100% then of the income, but at least then it's going to have your name, music, and they're going to think, well, that's a publishing company and it's not copyright control. So that's just the first little thing. It's open to everybody. Um, in the UK, um, uh, you do have to pay to join the, uh, the PRS. It's a one-off fee. Uh, it's about £100, I believe. Um, and uh, the, the MCPS, again, you'd have to pay to join. Got it. So basically, it makes you look more professional. Like you said, for sync, they're going to be like, oh, I'm dealing with a professional here and not just some indie artist who doesn't understand the business. That's and actually, it's a really interesting point, Brie, because that goes across everything you do in the music industry. It's the perception that you create is going to get the results. Um, and let me talk, have I got, give me a chance. I'll tell you a little story how I started my first major business. Okay. Um, I decided that um, I wanted to go into promotion and I had cards printed saying the UK's number one promotion company on it. And I hadn't actually done any work at all. I called it Music House and I actually had a switchboard put into my flat and I had four lines coming into it. And I had little post-it notes going around the room with each division name and a made up name of the person who worked there. And I literally used those names in the correspondence and things like that. Many people called up. Uh, I would actually answer the phone music house and they say, oh, can I speak to Bob James? Hold on a second, I'll just put you through. And I put different voices on, but I created the perception and they just thought it must be some big business this, that why am I not aware of this? Um, and sometimes that means a lot. So when you go in, if you actually act as like, if you're a writer, you, you don't have, never introduce yourself at a networking event saying, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a songwriter. I've just started out. Or I'm just learning. No, 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 no. You are a professional songwriter. Um, who are you working for? I'm currently writing songs for Harry Styles, uh, Little Mix, um, Dua Lipa. Now it doesn't. You're not saying you've got cuts with those. Artists. That's right. I'm writing songs that will be just perfect for them. They don't know about them yet. Absolutely, but you are going to pitch them, and you're, that's what you're working on. So you're you're telling the truth, but people go, "Oh, okay, that's good." And also being aware of what you do and being specific to a particular genre. Um, don't try and be jack of all trades and say, "Oh, I can do dance. I can do a singer songwriter. I can do." No, no, no. What are you really good at? What gives you joy? What what no touches your creativity and focus in on that and be all totally authentic in what you're doing. Um, so I always say, chase the, chase the creativity, never chase the money. The money follows the creativity. Mm. And, the, and I mean, that's a, some really good advice about the way you present yourself for sure. That makes all the difference. Totally. Absolutely. And, and going in there, I always say that uh, when you're working in the music industry, you are an entrepreneur. So therefore, you need to the, the three core tenets of being an entrepreneur. Um, now, you are taught in education the concept of motivation, which is you do a week's or a month's worth of work will give you a salary. OK, you do your academic um, assignments will give you a qualification. So it's literally you, you do this, you get a reward. That's motivation. But an entrepreneur um, um, works on inspiration. Mm. Now, inspiration, there is no reward. You just need to create something. So the three tenets of an entrepreneur will be inspiration. It will be belief, total belief in what you're doing. And gratitude for the fact that it's already had the success. Um, and what I say to my students, is, and I would say to you, if you knew that you were going to have a hit, a successful song, whether it's you as an artist or placed with another artist in four years' time, would you give up after three? <laughs> Yep. Why do people give up? Because they don't believe that they are going to be successful. Now, if you if you actually have that gratitude and, and act as though, yeah, I am successful. I am. It's just on its way. But let's get on with it. Let's get the team around me. Let's focus on continuing to write because I'm going to need more songs. It's coming. And that confidence when you're interacting with people in the industry is, is a bit like what they call the X factor. It's like, oh, yeah. Just yeah, no, I love, I love that. And that's, that's, I guess, kind of how I operated as an entrepreneur is that I always thought, well, you know, 95% of people give up, like within two years, or they, you know, businesses, small businesses close within this amount of time, well, I'm just going to outlast them. And yeah. as long as I outlast them, I, and in doing something quality, I know that I'm going to be successful. 
But like, I did pop music in promotion, all right? And it was a time that rave was the big thing. And all my competitors were calling me up saying, Bob, you need to do rave. And I said, I don't understand rave. I am a pop person. I love songs. And I stuck with it and I had no work whatsoever until that little bubble burst. And then Simon Cowell contacted me and said, I've got loads of work. And uh, Pete Waterman gave me Kylie Minogue to work. And we then set up a pop promotion division and we were the only ones doing it. We literally controlled the market. You just all sometimes you just got to wait for your time to come round, wait for the market to come round to you. Wow. Um, if you chase what's happening now, as an artist, especially, right? Just be authentic. Don't chase the market. The market will come round. It always changes. But you've just got to be who you are, real and authentic. And your songs, um, you know, is, is, they have to come from an emotion, uh, an authenticity. Yep, absolutely. Totally agree. Um, that's why we're called artists, right? Absolutely. absolutely. So let me ask you about the, um, the publishing. As we were talking about setting up your own publishing company and, and all of that, and it doesn't need to be complicated. It's just about creating a name and registering and all of that. But I was told that you still have to have a publishing administrator. I don't know if this is different in the UK than in the US um, to collect certain royalty streams. Is that true? Or can you, are you able as an independent publisher to collect all of your royalty streams? Well, at the, at the, it's, it's very simple. At the beginning, the main royalty streams will be your performance income and your mechanical income. They are going to be your main income streams. Now, as and when you, it grows, you can then do an administration deal with a major publisher or um, someone like Cobalt who are independent, but the size of a, a major publisher. Um, and you can do deals which are, you know, are not, um, that there is no assignment of copyright to them. It's a fixed term of say two to three years. There's no uh, retention period where they hold on to your copyright for a long period of time. And they're probably going to charge you at the most, probably about 10%. But they will then go out and collect all those other income streams. But you don't really need to worry too much about them until you have success. Once you have success, everybody will want to work with you. Now you can negotiate. Got it. And can you back collect? Like if you didn't have that in place and then let's say you had something that blew up, can you go back and still collect that stuff later? Yeah, well, the happen is if, you, if it's something's just blown up, all right, you'll have every publisher knocking on your door anyway, wanting to work with you, all right? But they, 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 they check the data, they see what's going on, and they will be able to see straight away who you're with because they can look it up on the right side of the PRO database and they'll see that, oh, it's being collected by yourself. So they'll be in touch with you. Trust me, if there's money to collect, they'll <laughs> yeah. be contacting you. They're businesses. Right, um, right. So a lot of people overthink it. And the key thing is if, um, you know, there's a certain income streams, maybe on, on YouTube, um, you know, you've got to be uh, um, a, a creator and, and, and the registrations you've got to be very careful about. But the, the core things, the, the level of success you're going to have is going to be across everything, which means there'll be a lot of money to collect and you will have people that will, will come along and offer to do that. And at that point, you'll have your lawyer, you'll negotiate a good deal. You, you've got the negotiating um, advantage because there's money to uh, collect. If you try and do that deal early, there's nothing in it for them. Right. They're not going to offer you a great deal, but they will if there's money to collect because you've got competition. So I, I think most people, they, they worry too much about the, the detail, the smaller detail. And I think what you've got to do is you've got to look at the bigger picture. Okay, so if you have a worldwide radio hit and you are collecting millions of dollars, are you going to worry about $1,000 that you've missed on YouTube <laughs> at that point? Probably not. Mm -hmm. And also that song that you wrote isn't the best song because you're going to write better songs because you will grow creatively as a better writer. And so you play catch up. And yes, in a lot of cases, you can find money that is sitting there. I think that the collection society is about six years you can collect. Yeah, no, that's true. Like in the US, the MLC, they've been collecting, right? And 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 you can still go and register those things now and back collect. Absolutely. Absolutely. But the thing is they can't do they you know they most of these are nonprofits. They can't retain the money. They have to give it to somebody. Right. <laughs> And if they can't find the PRS, for instance, if they can't find anybody, about six years later, they distribute it amongst all their members. 
um, and but but they can't, they're not allowed to hang on to it. Um, and at the end of the day, they have a mandate to collect this money on your behalf. Um, the key thing I would be saying is you need to chase your income stream. You've got to be aware of your usages. If you know that your song is being played on an Asian tour, you've got to go and check. You know, mm-hmm. where's my money? Um, I did it with um, uh, some uh, my songwriters that I, I managed, and they had uh, placed a key song with a German act, and they were playing um, arenas and stadiums. This act. Uh, and I was just going through the statements as they were coming through, and I thought, hang on a second, I haven't seen any live performance income for these core songs. And I know that it should be because the tour was named after one of them. Um, and so I contacted Gamer, and they were like, well, no, we've got all the, the, the sheets have come through, and it's not listed. So um, I actually called up uh, a friend in Germany who got me the DVD of the show so I could prove that the songs were actually played. Mm. Uh, sent those off to Gamer, who then went, ah. Um, and it turned out that the sheets that had been actually submitted, the management of that particular act, I can't say obviously who, uh, the management of that particular act had actually just listed on the, the, um, the, the Collection Society sheets all the songs that they had written and nobody oh. else's songs. Oops. Now, obviously, they had their uh, uh, wrists slapped and the royalties were then paid over. Um, so it's just being aware and, you know, it's a bit like setting your children free. You want them to go off and do whatever they do, but you're going to keep tabs on them a little bit mm-hmm. to see if they're not getting into trouble. Yep. Yep, that's true. And and that's where it's helpful to have an administrator because it's hard to keep up with all of those yeah. income streams that are out in the world. But it's a wonderful problem to have when you have right. those income streams. That's where we go do the deal. But at this early stage, don't panic about it. You know, it's uh, the most important thing is to get the momentum early. Yep. So when somebody is first first starting out, really, um, you recommend that they just keep their publishing in house. Do you ever recommend that they seek a publishing deal? Uh, I would recommend that they work with any publisher um there's a company um called in the uk called centric music and they don't take your rights you know it's a 30-day rolling contract and they specialize in sync so anything like that is is obviously useful if you can get people pushing for synchronization Mm -hmm. um i think that the other side of it is that there is nothing to stop you from doing what's called a single song assignment now what this basically means is that particular song not you as a writer will be signed to the publisher. They don't offer the best royalty rates. It's normally life of copyright. It's normally about 50-50. But the thing is, what it can do is it's a proof of concept that your songs are syncable. Mm -hmm. Um, And again, uh, an act that I was managing, I I placed one of their songs with Universal Music Production, the production library, and they got a sync for a mobile phone in Finland. Uh, But that created the momentum, the socials started to build up. Um, and then uh, probably uh, it must have been, I think it was about 18 months down the line, we did a major publishing deal with a proper advance because there was a proof of concept that the, we could prove through the data that the songs were connecting to people, that people heard it on the sync and then went and found the, the tracks. Got it. That makes sense. Yeah. That so sense. with everything, sometimes it's, you know, the early days, you, you may have to do deals that aren't the best deal. But if it gets momentum, gets something going, as long as the term is short or as long as you're only giving one song away, there's always going to be more songs. All right. What you don't want to do is sign a terrible deal for you as a writer for a long period of time. That is an absolute no. Do you think it ever makes sense to sign a deal as a writer with a publisher? uh, Yes, it can. Um, But I'm a big fan of independent publishers. Um, I think that if you're looking, as I say, if you're if you're an artist who collaborates with other writers and you get a share of the, the songwriting, but you're not really writing, we call it sort of the, the old fashioned gift publishing that sometimes mm. a writer has to give away, which I totally don't like. Um, but say, you know, a, a an artist who works with writers, but isn't really a writer, they're just going to take the check. They don't need anything else from a publisher. Um, but a good writer would, um, a good publisher working with a good writer, 
definitely they can open doors. You know, writing camps, they are still, the, the bigger companies are, people go to them first when they're looking for sync mm. because of the, the, the catalog that they've got. Uh, they do get better rates for sync as well. Um, they are the ones that can place the songs. They're dealing with the A&R the A people at the record labels on a daily basis because they've got such big names and some of them they publish. So there, there is going to be sometimes better results. However, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of the um, independents, people like Cobalt. Um, and I've worked with Cobalt in the past and they're great. And, um, and they do have a creative team and they, they have got a passion behind uh, what they do. Um, and there's a reason why some of the big names, um, you know, who, who have actually signed over, once they come out of their publishing deal, have then gone to the likes of Cobalt. But Cobalt is effectively an administration deal. Mm. All right, and you're not signing your rights but you're owning your own rights. But I always say with any publishing deal, it depends on what you need at the time. If you're an artist and you need funds to keep yourself going, because maybe your record advance wasn't that good, then you've got to think, well, how do I keep the thing moving? How do I keep that train moving? And if I've got to do a deal, but I'll do it, I'll get the advance, but I'll make sure that it's limited in the number of options that we give them. And I'll make sure that there's a cap so that my rights come back to me before I'm too old. Um, the mm. last uh, big publishing deal um, I did was that the key aim that I wanted to get was with the retention period was the fact that all the rights in those songs provided it, my uh, artist was recouped would come back to that artist by the time they were 36 years old. Mm. Now, at that point, they can place them with a collection, uh, you know, administration deal, and let them just collect the money. But at right. least that publisher was getting sinks. They actually pulled in some very big sinks. Um, mm. So, you know, they added value. So they were doing their job, yeah. Yes, that's the key. And this is where it comes down to the sort of gut feeling. Go and meet the teams. Um, and I do know some publishers that will say, look, give me a song. If I get a result, you place your song with me. If I don't, you can place it anywhere. Well, what have you got to lose? Right. <laughs> it's like, okay. So you've got, you've got, you know, you've placed it with a major artist. Well, okay. I, you can have 50% of the song. No, fine. You've got me started. I'm now a name. Yep. Yeah. Very. That's very useful. Hmm. Um, what about when you're collaborating with other writers? Is there any reason as a writer to work with or not to work with someone that is in a publishing deal? Um, no, it doesn't affect you because it's only their share of that song will be published by that publisher. So don't ever feel that you're pressured because um, say we did a song together and you were published. There is sometimes you know, the publisher puts pressure say on you saying, well, can you get the other 50% of the song? Mm. Well, no, and don't feel as though you have to place your, your share of the song with the other publisher. Keep it, keep it, keep it under your control until you're ready to do a deal. Um, you've got to be careful when you're collaborating. There's two sort of key things you've got to be clear about on collaborations. And the first one is, are you writing with another artist? So if you are an artist and the other writer is also an artist and you come up with that song, which one of you gets it? Mm. So I always say before you do anything, um, the first thing before you do any writing session is you need to have that conversation. Firstly, who are we writing for? Mm. Is this a song that is going to be pitched to third party or am I, are we writing for me or for you? Okay. Um, you've got to manage people's expectations. Um, so again, if the artist thinks, oh, I'm an artist, so of course they're writing for me. And then that song is pitched and Dua Lipa wants it. And you're going, hang on, that's going to Dua Lipa. And you're going, now the, art, the artist saying, well, I've signed a record deal down the pub. And you no, know, I've got a manager who's you know, a secondhand car dealer who thinks he can. You don't want that song with them. You want the song over there where it's going to earn some money. But you've got to have that conversation up front. Mm. That's yeah, that's that's a good thing to to do. Mm -hmm. um, and and the other key thing is agree how you're going to split the copyright. Mm -hmm. in the song. Is it 50, 50 because you're both in a room is one of you going to do the music and the other one is doing the lyrics. Are you going to keep them separate in that sense? 
Um, is there going to be, well, we'll both write together, but um, if the song doesn't do anything in a year that we can both take our contributions back, you've, you've got to be very, very clear. And it all depends on the circumstance. So for instance, if I sent you a track, say I was a dance producer and I sent you a track and said, I want a, a song on the top of it. First thing you've got to be saying is, I'll tell you what, I'll do that and I'll send it over to you. However, I'm not assigning that song to that, to that instrumental track unless it's actually released. So it doesn't mm. form part of that composition. So that way, what you're doing is all rights reserved, effectively, you're keeping the copyright that back. If they don't use your top line, your melody and lyrics, you could place it with another dance record. And you need to have that option. Interesting, okay. So because you are, you're composing that, basically. It is its own mm -hmm. copyrighted thing. Yeah. And they will, they will probably be asking 50% for the track because it's a co-write as, as such. So they'll be saying, well, you know, this is 50%, but you've got to be very clear. Well, I'm not going to bond this together as 100% unless you actually use it. Because I have seen people send tracks out and, and then, of course, nothing happens. Uh, and then when the, the person sent off their top line and maybe gets a release, they go, well, hang on, that's my part of our song that we wrote together. Mm. So again, always make it very clear and confirm it in writing via email, exactly what you have agreed on the phone. Yeah, in writing, very, very important for sure. Absolutely, yeah. Um, what about like the right, um, there's a particular name for this right, like the, the right to be the first artist to release the song? The first mechanical right. Mm -hmm. is what they, yeah, when you write a song, um, as songwriters, you get to say who releases it first, okay? So what you don't want to do is to be sending it out to an a and at a record label and they just decide they're going to release it. What you want to do is you might have three or four artists want that song, so you get to decide that first release. So always control that, and that means that always whenever you pitch in a song, um, is, is actually just to make sure you're putting the international copyright notice on that and all rights reserved. OK, so you're basically saying you can't do anything without my permission. Um, what you then want to do is once that first mechanical license has gone, it means anybody can then cover that song without your permission, provided that they don't change the lyrics and they don't change the structure of the song, because that infringes your moral rights of integrity. Right. OK, so the so the key thing is that first usage. That's why you've got to be careful because um, I've seen it again with people, they go into a writing session and they think, okay, we're going to pitch this and the other writer then suddenly releases it. Mm. It's like, what have you done that for? You know, if it's in the public domain and it's been released on Spotify, I can guarantee you that probably half the artists that you could have pitched that to will not touch it because mm. it's commercially available. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Like, the, so there's a there's a value to that, to it being yes. the first release. Yes, there is. Uh, and I have known um, songwriters. When you get to that top tier level, uh, people will pay you money to hear those songs first, so they get first look at that first mm. mechanical license. So yes, there is a value attached to that. And what about? I know that you can. Um, as an artist, like you can kind of put a reserve <laughs> on a song, you know, and be like, yep. I, I have the right to record this and, you know, for the next year. Mm -hmm. And do they pay for that right? Uh, record companies. Okay. Not if they can get away with it. Absolutely not. No. What they will <laughs> do is, you know, record companies pay off. Oh. <laughs> no, what they will do is they will come and ask to hold the song. They, they mm. want you to allow them to hold the song. Um, as a manager, when I was managing songwriters, um, if I granted a hold, it would be for a very short period of time, three months. Mm -hmm. um, in some cases, if I felt that song was big, then I'll just go, nope, first come, first served. And I'll put the pressure for them to make the decision. Because, you know, what you don't want to do is to sit on it. And it might be very current now. Right. Um, right. And... You know, but you've got to you've got to you've got to be careful about um, some of the, the shadier uh, things that could go on. Say an artist had, sorry, a, a record label had an artist signed, and they had a song, 
and you've just written a song which is appealing to the same similar type of artist that they've got signed. What they might do is say, well, can we hold that? All right, because what they want to do is they want the time to get this song out rather mm-hmm. than give it to one of their competitors who could then have the success. So you've just got to play, they've got to think about what the, the rationale behind it is. So you know, what I would be doing is as, as, a, as a manager or if I was advising someone you know, as a mentor, I would be saying, okay, give them a bit of time, but police it and then come back to them and say, I'm sorry, uh, unless you can commit or pay something, to hold that song, I'm going to place it elsewhere because it's too good a song to sit on. Right. And you've got to have the confidence. They say, all right, well, no, we won't record it then. Go, okay. Because I can guarantee if it's that good a song, they're not going to let it go. Mm-hmm. If they really want it, they will not let that song, so, no, that song go. They'll be doing everything they can to make sure that they record it. Wow. Yeah, got to have some balls in that situation. <laughs> I've had some showdowns, I'll tell you, in the past. <laughs> uh, literally, I've, I've had, I've had uh, managers swearing at me. Um, and because uh, one of them was actually an artist trying to get a share of the song. Uh, they wanted 30% of the song to cut it because they said it was going to be a single. So we want 30, you want, want you, your writers to give us 30%. And I said, no. Um, and literally it went down to the wire and the, the MD of the record label was calling me and saying, Bob, you've got to do a deal. This is the single. This is the one we want to go for. I said, please do a deal. And I said, no, I don't tell you how to run your business. Don't you tell me how to run my business? And it's no. And they cut the song and we didn't give anything away. But it went down to literally the wire. Mm. But what I managed to find out was that actually the, the song had gone to radio because the record companies are always doing that. They, they're testing things. Mm. And radio had loved, said they love it. So they'd already serviced it. Um, and their head of radio used to work for me by promotion company and told me. So I knew that I was just going, nope, I'm just going to sit here. And uh, it went to the wire. But they, you know, we got, we, we got the song. Wow. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> that's crazy. Um, so is there anything else that we need to cover in relation to publishing and uh, collaboration and all that that we haven't touched on yet? I'm sure there's a lot, but anything that comes to mind? There, there is a lot. Um, and, and understanding all the different parts of copyright is so important. Um, obviously, I, can, you know, I, I teach a 25-week module on just on publishing. And that's only <laughs> wow. a about master's and then we're going even deeper. Um, so... Uh, <laughs> There's a lot, but the key thing is, is understanding your rights. Don't rush into deals. Do not do anything without having an attorney or a lawyer um, to overlook any contract. Um, a lot of people go, oh, but lawyers are too expensive. It'll be far, far more expensive if that is a hit song and you've got a bad deal. So always have independent legal advice um, and, be, and believe in your songs. Don't throw them away. You know, If you believe you've got something, have the courage of your conviction because um, not everybody will get it. I've sent out songs to people and um, I'll give you another example. This is, this is, this is how the music industry works. Uh, I actually took a song in and pitched it to uh, an A&R at a record label. Uh, and they went, oh, no, 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 we don't like this. It's too shouty. So, oh, not very good at all. The next meeting I went to, I got it placed. All right, they said, yeah, definitely. Our artist is gonna cut that. Two months later, I went back into that first A&R and I said, what are you looking for? And he, and he played me the artist that released that song, the same song that I pitched him. Oh I need gosh. something like this, Bob. And I said, I played that to you two months ago. And you said, no, you didn't. I said, yes, you, I did. And you said it was too shouty. Oh, I must have had a bad day then. <laughs> so have belief in your songs. And, and remember, like this, with the other key thing with sync is that the music supervisors um, have a job, and that is to find music that fits the story, the brief, uh, the brand, the scene, they are not there to find an opportunity for your song. Mm-hmm. Now, when you pitch for sync, sync is the icing on the cake. All right. It's the only thing you can do with sync is make someone aware of your music. That's it. You can't persuade someone to use it because that's not how it works. Right. You've just got to be the filter and don't send in stuff for sync that doesn't actually accurately meet the brief because you will get to the point that people won't even listen to your music if it's not on brief. So for the sure. key they're just, is, they're sorry. looking to fit, 
for your music to fill a function for them. Yes. Right. I mean, it's I, not about how good it is. It's I mean, no, it's does it fit into this thing spot that I need it to fit into? Yeah. And if you write a song saying, here I am driving along in my car and it's the best car in the world, it's never going to get a car advert because the creative agency will get shot by the brand who said that's too cheesy. Mm -hmm. They want something that's got whooshes and technological know-how that makes the car jump out or something that matches the demographic that the car appeals to, which is a reason why um, Jaguar used Sting to promote mm -hmm. Jaguar cars. Because they, they looked at it and said, people who like Sting will probably buy a Jaguar car. Right. Or like those all those uh, Bob Seger and the truck ads, you know, that I remember from the 80s. It's like, yeah, people that like Bob Seger are going to love this truck. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So remember that the, it's the other way around. With radio, you're pitching how good the song is. Mm -hmm. With sync, it's the other way around. It's making people aware and hoping that it will just happen to fit exactly what they're looking for at that time. Yep. Absolutely. Oh, this is, this has all been really, really helpful. Um, like what? You want to go on for you, another couple of hours? <laughs> oh my gosh. I feel like I could, you know, I always learn so much in these. Um, I think that, you know, the one thing, like you said about getting a lawyer and all of that, like, how do you know when your music is good enough to be spending money on that kind of thing? Because, you know, there are people that, that come to me and they're like, I have written 200 songs and I haven't released any of them. And then when you hear that, you wonder like, how, you know, how many of those are actually worth pursuing as a song? Well, it's not quantity. It's always quality. Right. Um, and <clears throat> if somebody says to me, okay, I've written 200 songs, I would say, right, send me your top four. If I don't get it on the top four, I'm not going to get it on anything else. Mm -hmm. You've got to be able to filter your own output. Um, the other thing is, and this is a, goes back to what I said at the very beginning, so entrepreneurial spirit. If you don't believe in your music, why will anyone else believe in it? Mm -hmm. Now, um, no, I use a, 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 a we have a, in, in our practice, um, I have a, a thing called Target that I use. Um, and that is that it's a, you know, a, an acronym um, and what it does is we're trying to get people to to work as an entrepreneur we're trying to get people to be all totally authentic we're trying to sort of get people to actually totally understand that what what is holding them back why aren't they sending those songs out why aren't they putting those songs out now if they don't believe in those songs then don't put them out and i get it but you, if you absolutely believe in something then surely you've got to actually get behind it and you've got to gather your troops. You've got to, if you totally believe in something, you, you know it's going to be a hit, in which case, you know you're going to need a lawyer, you know you're going to need your team, mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe start talking to publishers or, or trying to pitch for sync because you know if you don't believe that it will do that, then you, you're not going to invest into it, no, but nobody else will either. And what if you're stuck how, in that perspective of like, you know, the artist perspective of the person who writes their own music of like, I can only imagine this being a hit for me because this is from my perspective. And, you know, how do you know if your song would make sense to pitch to other artists? Well, first of all, is, is do you want to let go of it? If you're an artist, it might be, you think, no, this is too personal. And so this song is mine and it's staying with me. Um, the, the thing is, sometimes there is a song that you've written um, that most people will have the similar emotions. If you imagine a song is a, is a, a transit, it's a vehicle that carries an emotion, energy in motion. So when you sing it, it's energy, it's sound waves. Um, and what you're looking for is a connection. And if, if there is an authentic feeling behind a song, there will be a connection somewhere along the line. Now, the thing is, there could be a song that you've written. Now, um, one of my artists wrote a song, which was actually, she wrote it with a, a, another published writer and came back and said, it's definitely not for me. It's absolutely not for me. And I said, okay. Uh, I said, I said, what's it called? He said, we haven't even got a title. Um, it's, we just called it Ooey, 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 um, because that was a sort of hook. And I was like, okay. Um, and anyway, myself together with the publisher, we pitched it. 
for other people. Now that got cut in South Korea by a boy band called Shiny and did about 100,000 units in its first week. So there is a market for everything somewhere. And the thing is, if you put, if you think about the emotions that you have as a songwriter and you put them in, there's going to be someone somewhere who has, is going to connect with that emotion, has a similar experience. And that is going to, if, as, well as, as long as you've crafted it and not put, um, oh, my partner, Simon, <laughs> did this to me, because then it's too specific and it's not going to relate. Yeah. <laughs> right. So you've got to, you've got to keep it a little bit ambiguous. Um, now, I'll give you an example. So I, I mentioned before I had an artist we signed to Sony, and that was an artist called Kelvin Jones. Now, he, this is this is a beautiful little story, um, but he wrote a song, okay, um, Call Your Home. And it was based about somebody he had met, and but he, he wanted it to be a little bit ambiguous, but there was an emotion behind it. And he literally produced it up on his laptop. He uploaded it to YouTube. Someone he went to school with saw it and posted it on Reddit. Within 24 hours, it was on the front page of Reddit and his socials were going crazy. And um, he actually even got, uh, I think it was a tweet that came through and said, we really love this video. Can we show it on our TV show? And he thought it was a bit of a joke. and said, yeah, knock yourself out. And that was Good Morning America. Woo! Now, on the back of that, he had 80 deal offers come through. People saying, I'll make you a star. I'll give you $500 for everything, all your rights. No, 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 no. no. And eventually we came on as management and then we managed to sort of make sense of everything, built it up. And I always say, if the song's good enough, people will wait. You can hold out. They're not going to go anywhere. They believe in you as an artist. They're not going to go anywhere. Don't be in a rush. Mm. And we did a deal and, um, and it went on and had success. And you can find that on, on uh, YouTube. But wow. that, that's the same. But, it's, but the emotion was behind the song. It was authentic. And people connected with it and everybody if you ask five people what it meant they've all got different meanings mm -hmm. that's the thing with a piece of art i think it it, it has a life of its own it's interpretation yeah. once it leaves you you know it, it it's yeah like you said people can interpret it completely differently than the way you you created it and that's that's fine that's great because that means it's going to be a lot more universal absolutely and, and remember, music, art, technology, fashion are linked. Mm. And, you know, you, if you're going into the industry, you need to embrace everything. You know, you have to embrace technology um, because it's, that's the world we live in. And, uh, and that's how you get your music to an audience now. And, uh, and the thing is also, you know, people sometimes, they get a little bit protective about songs. And especially artists, they say, this is the single. I'm going to hold on to this. I'm not putting it out yet. But I would be saying, put it out now. If it's your best song, put it out now, because then people might discover you. And trust me, if you're good, you're going to write a better song mm. in the future. But if that's the best song you're ever going to write, then that's too limiting, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So you've got probably to not going to have a very long career. Exactly. So you've got to have this go back to that belief and it's saying, no, I'm going to put this out. I'm just going to let it go out there and do what it needs to do. And I'm going to get behind it. Um, and I've, I've had people say, well, I'm not putting money into social media. That's going to cost me $200 or something. Um, I can't afford to spend that. Well, but if you want a record label to sign you, it's going to spend a million dollars on it. Then it's the same with any tech startup, any business you, you go in to get funding or you try and scale up. They want to see that the person at the, at the coalface, the person who's created it, has got skin in the game, has got, it believes in it enough that they're prepared to invest their own money in it. Yep. And, and I would always say, if you're coming into the music industry, um, don't come in small. Come in big. Go for it. Do everything you can. Learn everything you can about the industry. Network with people. Learn how to network. It's just throw yourself in. Become a master. Because one thing you're going to do in the future, you can look back and go, there was, I did not leave a stone unturned. Mm -hmm. Or you're going to be in the future looking at it and go, if only I had done this. And that's terrible. Mm. Uh, and remember, it's the journey. Part of it is the journey. And it's, a, you know, and it's not about having financial success. I always say with an artist, it's about expressing your creativity. It's being authentic to who you are. That gives you joy. If that's giving you joy, hey, don't we spend money to have joy? 
<laughs> yep. <laughs> so why aren't you spending money? Go, you know, I'm not saying go ridiculous, but there's there's so much available to you is, is understand the industry so you don't make those mistakes. Man, lots of great advice. Wow. I, like you said, there's probably so much more that we could cover, but we're hitting the hour mark. So we're definitely right. going to have to shut down this conversation, but thank you so much. This has been so great. And you've given us so many great specific examples that I know that people that are listening can really hang on to and it can give them something tangible to understand the concepts that we're talking about here. So thank you so much for that. Uh, speaking of socials, are you on socials? Can can the listeners connect with you? Yeah, you can. If, uh, I think everything is uh, at Bob James UK um, on Twitter is at Bob James. Um, I got there first. I'm not the <laughs> jazz musician. Uh, he's Bob James music, but just at Bob James. And um, if you go to my website, um, getmoneyfrommusic.com, and there's a contact form there if ever you needed to get in touch or anything like that. But um, you know, I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> I'm, I'm here to help people, here to serve. Perfect. Getmoneyfrommusic.com. What a great URL. So you guys go check that out. Thank you so much, Bob. This has been such a fun conversation. I feel like there might be a part two coming soon. Oh, so. okay, great. We'll Thank you so well. much for all of this. <laughs> you know, I know you're a teacher, so you can, t you can talk, right? You got to fill up uh, hours of lecture time. So I know that there's I so know. much more we could talk about on an, on another episode. Yeah. I've done, I've really done five hours of those today. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Wow. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome. This has been an absolute pleasure and thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to the Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician. <laughs>